Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam amma bar habita fillah I thought it would be beneficial uh, for myself first and foremost and hopefully some of you will take this journey with me and it will be a revision of uh, the book of Tahara uh, in the book uh, Umdat Ahkam and Umdat Ahkam is a one of the smaller books of hadith collections that have to do with uh, ahkam, that have to do with rulings as far as the fiqh, uh, masail al fiqhiyah And this is a very important book because it is one of the mukhtasirat, it's one of the smaller uh, books, and the ahadith are all in Bukhari and or Muslim, or both, and they... Uh, have immense benefits. So what I want to do for the sake of revision is make ta'liqat, make small commentary with regards to this hadith and go through this uh, this whole uh, uh, book of Tahara. And we'll spend time each sitting, maybe read three ahadith, um, and it will just be for the sake of revision and gaining some benefits with regards to how to practice our religion, especially with regards to Tahara. And the book, we'll probably use different books, whatever happens to be in my hand at the time, but I do want to uh, use and benefit from this, and I just began looking at it, and it's called Al-Udda Fi Fawaid Ahadith Al-Umda. This is um, an explanation uh, which brings out benefits of this book, Umda Tahkam, I'm talking about. And this is a, a new book that came out last year, and is by uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman uh, uh, Nasser Al Barak. He's one of the major scholars in Riyadh. Uh, he's well known for his fiqh and his uh, his ilm wa khair. And so we're going to uh, begin, and I hope you take this journey with me because it will be beneficial, especially for the uh, person who hasn't studied these masail. So we're going to begin the first hadith uh, without getting into any other trappings, and I'll try to be super brief, and we're just going to go with ta'liqat, so that way we can get through this material, and it'll be a good revision for me, for many of these hadith I have forgotten. The first hadith is the hadith, in, uh, the hadith on uh, Umar bin al-Khattab, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, qala, sam'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yaqul, inna ma'amala bin niyat, wa fi rawaya, bin niyat, وإنما لكل امرئ مناوى فمن كانت هجته إلى الله ورسوله فهجته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجته إلى الدنيا أو يصيبها إلى الدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة يتزوجها فهجته إلى ما هجر إليه أخرجه شيخان. This is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. The hadith of Umar bin Al-Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه. And he said, I heard the message of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم saying. Uh, actions are tied to the intentions and everyone should get that for what he intended. Therefore, he who migrates uh, to take some woman in... Uh, therefore, uh, he who migrates to Allah and his messenger, then he has migrated to Allah and his messenger. And he who migrates to for some worldly gain, gain, worldly gain or to take some woman in marriage, then he will get that for what he intended and is in Bukhari and Muslim. This hadith is hadith azim. And many of the books of hadith begin with this hadith. And from the fawa'id of this hadith, and this is how we're going to study this, uh, just bringing some benefits from these ahadith and why they're in the book of fiqh and tahara, and the kitab of tahara. So first, uh, as uh, Sheikh Baraki mentioned, he said, have a hadith, usul min usul al-deen. He said, this hadith is a foundation from amongst the foundations of the religion. And the reason he says this is because our deeds, uh, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, in ma'amalu bin niyat, verily actions are tied to the intentions. So your uh, actions are tied to your intentions. And we're going to get into that when we talk about some of these fawa'id and uh, get into more details. But what we need to understand is that for example, in Islam, in order to have your deeds accepted by Allah Azza wa two conditions have to be in place. 
First, you have to ikhlas lillah, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning you worship in only Allah. So, for example, in Salat, how does this hadith apply? It applies that, for example, when you pray, you pray only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your intention is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfill that pillar of Islam, and that there is no shirk in that ibadah. That's ikhlas. The second condition is mutaba, meaning is following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you are going to pray like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're not going to pray how some of the people say, they sit in a room and say, Allahu, Allahu, or they say their imam has made hajj, or your, their imam no longer has a pray. No, these are things that are not from the sunnah. So even if, if their imam had uh, sincerity, and if those people who claim, make these claims, really had sincerity in their hearts, their action is still battle. And this is, comes from other ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Aisha, that, uh, من أحتث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فرد. Whoever does something in this affair of ours, whoever, uh, whoever, does, whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have it rejected. So the one who innovates with a new type of prayer, a new understanding of prayer, that will be rejected. Doesn't matter how much their intention, doesn't matter even if it was only for Allah. They just really had this personal relationship. They want to go in the woods. They say, I'm not going to pray the five daily prayers anymore. I'm going to have a new salat. Mine is going to be based on uh, transcendental meditation. And it's only to Allah though. Not the Buddhist type, but it's only going to be to Allah. And I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to cry. All that humbling, all that crying, all those tears will not make up for the other condition, which is that your prayer has to be in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the second condition of amal. Some other benefits we gain from this hadith is that, as the Shaykh mentioned, he mentions that an action which does not have intention is considered long. It's considered, um, you know, something that is wasteful. Uh that you know it has it has no benefit you know it, it's not uh, and it, so that means it's not considered ibadah that's the most important thing another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the intention is uh niya fi kulli ibadah that all your worship requires that you have an intention so even going back to this hadith the the alfaz of the hadith or the mantuq of the hadith the actual words in the hadith the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said whoever migrates for allah and his messenger then his migration is for allah and his messenger so we know that hijra migration is a type of ibadah it's a type of worship and here the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever migrates for allah and his messenger then his then that's his, he, he's going to get what he intended. He's going to get the reward of hijra. But if you migrated because you wanted a better job in that society, or you migrated, as the Prophet ﷺ said, said to take some woman in marriage, you wanted to marry from those people, you wanted a visa from that country, whatever the case may be, then that's what you'll, your intention is. So that means you will lose the benefit of that e migration for ibadah. But if your migration was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will get the reward of that uh, act of ibadah. So that's why it requires, that's a condition, the niya is in condition for ibadah, as we mentioned. Another important thing that I must mention, the Sheikh mentions here, is that, that there is no difference between, uh, or that what distinguishes ibadah from custom is the intention. How? For example, the example of the Salat. Now we know, for those who, I used to practice yoga pretty pretty immensely when I was younger. Before, right up when I was a new Muslim and before Islam. And some of the poses and some of the things could possibly resemble some uh, uh, movements in Salat. So if we take, for example, we say, there's a person that does all the same motions of salat. Exactly. They make ruku or they make sujood. They rafa min ruku. They, you know, have the, they sit in between the, 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 the prostrations 
and all of the acts of prayer. But they do it in a manner to stretch their back, to really to get their spine up, uh, to loosen up the shoulders when they're, you know, make sujude, get stretch all that, stretch the shoulders and stuff. That, even if it resembled 100% the Salat, it's not Salat. And that's what this hadith is showing us. In the Ma'amala bin Yad. So we see that actions, even if they, the things, uh, actions, when they resemble one another, what distinguishes them is the intention. Another example, which is very important for us to know and understand. For example, if someone missed uh, Dhuhr prayer, and they come in the masjid, and it's, Salat al-Asr. And their intention is to pray Asr. And they pray the Asr before Dhuhr. Dhuhr and Asr, someone who's externally has no way to distinguish between those two prayers. They're both four units of prayers. They're, uh, they're both uh, without, uh, you know, they're both silent to yourself. And, you know, they have the same actions. So how are you going to distinguish Dhuhr from Asr? Even without that issue of coming in for the Salat al-Asr. How do you distinguish in Dhuhr and Asr? It's the niya. It's the intention. So it goes back to your intention. Oh, I intended Dhuhr. You know, this is Dhuhr. I'm praying the Dhuhr prayer. You know, that's your intention. Your internal t intention. That's what you prepared for. Or uh, otherwise, you prepared for the Salat al-Asr. That's what distinguishes those two acts of Ibadah. Those are both acts of Ibadah. But what distinguishes them is the intention. So it, it distinguishes between custom and ibadah, and it distinguishes between various acts of worship or ibadah. Another benefit of this hadith, and I'm sorry that it's taken so long, and I want to keep this brief, and I'm not going to do this the rest of the lecture, the rest of the series. Uh, there's just so many benefits. We could sit all night, but let me just end with one more. Uh this hadith also shows us the obligation to make our actions sincerely to Allah. It also shows us the impermissibility of, you know, that it's haram to do uh, commit shirk, to do actions for other than Allah, meaning acts of worship for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that all actions uh, go back to Allah azza wa jal. All acts of worship should be done uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or else that will be a form of shirk. Uh, another important uh, benefit of this hadith is that the intention itself is an action. It's a type of it's a type of uh, action in and of itself, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, malu bin niyat. Verily, actions are tied to the intentions. So, in and of itself, the niyyah is also a, an act of uh, worship, and it's an act and it's an action in and of itself. Action qalbiya, you know, an action of the heart, and those are some the most some very important benefits. And there's just uh, as I said, so many. We ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evils. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam.